Tonight, two young brothers fleeing for their lives, but only one of them would make it. My phone rang, and it was my younger son. And I couldn't, I couldn't understand what he was saying at first because he was just, like, screaming down the phone. Um, and then he said, Negus has been stabbed. We need to know who killed 15-year-old Negus McLean. Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. We are live for the next hour with a studio full of detectives from all over the UK working together and ready to take your calls on tonight's cases. We're going to have more on the murder of 15-year-old Negus McLean very soon. But first, let's take a quick preview of our other appeals. We've got the 66-year-old businesswoman who was attacked and thrown down the stairs by a knife-wielding burglar. I could hear his footsteps coming behind him. I thought I was going to die, and I was fighting for my life. And 25 years after teenager Elaine Doyle was strangled just yards from her home in Greenock, her father, his health now frail, is still determined to find her killer. We would like to put a face to that person, who he is, why he would need to take Elaine's life. It doesn't get any easier but will never give up. We also need to know who attacked this young woman in Rochdale just moments after these images were taken. She was left with severe head injuries and bizarrely, her assailants took her clothes and then they dressed her in this nightie. Do you recognise it? We've also some great news on previous cases, including two convictions for murder. And Rav's here with his wanted faces and CCTV. Rav. Yeah, and tonight's faces include people wanted for rape, GBH and theft. Plus, I've got plenty of CCTV, including this lot of armed robbers losing their loot out of the back of their getaway car. And Matthew, what have you got for us? Well, it's the story of how police finally caught up with John Cooper, a labourer who in May was found guilty of two double murders in Pembrokeshire in the 1980s. He terrorised the area for decades, committing dozens of other offences, including violent burglaries and rape, all while protesting his innocence. I'm, I'm fed up being called a liar. I'm trying to help you people. And, uh, well, clap your eyes on this little lot, a rather fine collection of jewellery worth almost a million pounds here in the studio tonight. It's all been recovered from a single rather modest house, and if any of it's yours, then we would sincerely love to hear from you. But we begin with the murder of 15-year-old Negus McLean in Edmonton in North London. He's one of the six teenage victims of knife crime in London already this year. But behind that statistic lies the cold reality of what actually happened, the violent and terrifying death of a child. Hey, Negus, man, wake up, bro. You can't do this to me, man. You can't do this to me. Wake up, man. I'm sure of you. Hey, Negus, wake up, please. Hey, Negus, man. It's a terrible thing to have inside of your head to think that's how your child died. I have no words to express how it feels to hear your son is dead. And... <sighs> it's an all too familiar story in many parts of Britain. Young men, often no more than boys, being killed by their peers. But this time, the true terror of these attacks has been captured on camera as a brutal gang intent on violence take to the streets. All right, boys? For Ingrid McLean and her children, Sunday, April the 10th, had been much like any other. Ingrid was meeting her sister for lunch, while her 15-year-old son, Negus, and his younger brother were planning to meet up with friends. I would say there were more friends than brothers. You know, sometimes they say you can't choose your family, but they would have chosen one another, without doubt. Um, to his younger brother, he was everything that a brother... If you look in the dictionary what brother mean, means, that is what he was to his younger brother. 
they set off together towards the local park, their route taking them past Hartford Road in Edmonton. But little did they know that a violent gang of youths were circling the area just a few hundred yards away. As Negus and his brother arrived here, at the corner of Hartford Road and Bouncers Road, they came face to face with the gang. Hey, what are you watching? Yo, get in, get in! CCTV captures the moment of panic when Negus and his friends began to cycle for their lives. The gang chased after them down Bouncers Road. By the time they reached Westminster Road, Negus' friends had managed to escape, but his brother was still with him. Negus told him to keep running while he stood up to face the gang alone. Telling his brother to run and not look back, just go, is him. He, that is just him. He wouldn't have thought twice about himself. He would have just thought about protecting his brother. Once Negus had been isolated, the onslaught of violence began. Some in the group beat him with metal poles, and one of them had a knife. He began stabbing Negus in the legs and stomach. The attack lasted less than a minute, but the knife was used with such force that the blade snapped off inside his body. Well, my phone rang, and it was my younger son. And I couldn't, I couldn't understand what he was saying at first, because he was just like screaming down the phone. Um, and then he said, Negus has been stabbed. So. Suddenly, everyone just started ringing my phone. All his friends started ringing my phone. All my friends started ringing the phone. I couldn't understand what half of them were saying. They were all in tears, hysterics. I didn't even understand what was going on. And when I got there, they wouldn't let me see him, because they said they were working on him. Despite the best efforts of paramedics and bystanders, this is where Negus bled to death. Police are now desperate to catch those responsible before they kill again. Steve, is there any evidence to say whether this was a, a targeted attack? Well, certainly the... The gang recognised Negus. We know Negus has got some links to a, a local gang. He's not heavily involved, but they certainly recognised him and gave chase. People around here will be scared to come forward, won't they? They will be, but they need to recognise that... I understand that they may be told not to speak to the police. They may have had previous bad experience with the police, but ultimately they need to have that trust and the confidence to come and speak to us, take that first step and speak to us. If they're scared, if they don't want to be scared for the rest of their lives, then they need to speak up and get these people off the street, or else that's just the way it's going to be forever. He died 16 days before his 16th birthday. He had his whole life ahead of him. So many things he wanted to do. So many plans he had. And he'll never do them now. He was always my baby. He was my negus, and that's what I called him. He was just my perfect baby, and he's very missed. He had his whole life ahead of him, a tragic waste of a young life. I have to tell you, sadly, there have already been uh, two more murders of teenage boys in London since then. DCI Stephen Clayman, who is leading this investigation, joins me now. Thanks for joining us. Um, the blade snapped off in his body. This was a brutal and terrifying attack. Absolutely. I mean, when they spotted Negus, he, he didn't have a chance. He must have been absolutely terrified. They chased him. I don't know whether they, they specifically targeted him, but he didn't have a chance once they started chasing him. OK. Crucial to this case is the CCTV from earlier on in the day. Let's look, uh, first of all, at this. Explain to us what we're looking at here. Well, this is um, Bounces Road, and the gang here are riding towards uh, the junction with Hartford Road. They're quite erratic. They're riding uh, in front of cars, wearing face coverings and the hoods up. Someone must have seen them. Yeah, I mean, if you down. were that pedestrian, if you were in that car, you might remember seeing that. That's quite an unusual thing You'd to see. You'd probably have to slow down for them. Yeah, indeed. Now, there's another bit of CCTV. Tell us about this. This is the, the point at which the gang see Negus. They recognise him. They start chasing him. And now, again, yeah, Negus and his, his brother and their friends are now being chased towards uh, Westminster Road, where he was stabbed. That's really terrifying, seeing that, actually. Now, when you were talking to Matthew, you were talking about witnesses coming forward. And, of course, you know 
there will be witnesses, there'll be people who know things who just feel too terrified to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm appealing to, certainly to people who are, have knowledge of or connected to the gangs themselves. I know and I do appreciate they won't want to speak to police, they're told not to speak, yeah. but they must take that step and, and, and speak to us. They can ring in the strictures of confidence, I'll take great care, and also I can always meet, meet them out of their area and discreetly, but they must make that first step and, okay. and speak to me. Very briefly, big reward here. £20,000 reward for information leading to arrest okay. and prosecution. Thanks for nice. Uh, I mean, you've seen what a terrible impact this murder has had. If you know anything about it, you can speak to the detectives now here. This is the number, 0500 600 600. If you are concerned about your identity and you want to call the independent charity Crime Stoppers anonymously, their number is 0800 treble 5 treble 1. Now, Rav has his first collection of wanted faces. And first up is this guy, 25-year-old Nathan Allen Lucas from Nuneaton. He's wanted after being convicted of tying up and raping three young women who he met via the internet. He failed to appear at court in Leamington last month and was convicted in his absence. He has links throughout the country and has various tribal-style tattoos, including the logo of the band Slipknot, on his inner left forearm. Though this may have been covered over recently with another tattoo. Next is Rose Denise Williams. The 36-year-old is wanted after absconding from Send Prison in Surrey in February, where she was serving a sentence for robbery. Williams, who speaks with an Irish accent, has links to London, Kent and Belfast. She uses numerous aliases, including the surnames Brown, Hobbs and McDonough, and has the letter I tattooed on both forearms. Number three here is Farkhar Zaman, and he's wanted in connection with the rape of a woman in Burnley in November 2009. Zaman, who's 39 today, also has links to Manchester and uses the alias Chima Nalaz. He may well be working in a restaurant or takeaway, so why not give him a birthday surprise and tell us where he is? And lastly, Gary Wayne Burke. He's wanted in connection with the large-scale supply of heroin and crack cocaine in Luton. Burke, who's 23, has a keen interest in the hip-hop music scene and may well be seen at clubs, studios and events in London. He also has links throughout Bedfordshire. Remember, all of tonight's faces are on the website, bbc.co.uk forward slash crimewatch. And if you know where any of them are, then the number is 0500 600 600, or you can text 63399, crime, space, and then your message. Really important to leave that space, or your message won't get through. Now, in February, this businesswoman from the pretty little village of Bradwell in the Peak District was beaten and thrown down the stairs during an extremely violent burglary in her home. Police think the attacker is local and they need your help to catch him. This small haulage business in the picturesque Derbyshire village of Bradwell has been quietly run by a local family for decades. But in February, the owner, Audrey Charles, was viciously beaten and attacked in her own home by a burglar who had decided the elderly businesswoman would be an easy target. I moved into Bradwell in 1968 when I got married. It's been a lovely, happy family home. We've run our business from here and it's just been my life. My husband had already established the garage business. In 1972, we created our haulage business. My dad died four years ago, and it left my mum absolutely devastated. Um, she was very fragile, and she still is very fragile, but she's learnt to cope. We decided, all together as a family, that we'd got to go forward. My mum was really starting to get on with her life. She didn't enjoy being on her own, but she was getting used to it. Um, since this has happened to her, it's completely altered that. On the day that the burglary happened, we decided that we'd go to Bakewell for the day. We had some lunch, we had a look round Bakewell, and then I went into the bank because I needed to draw £4,500 out for our driver's wages. 
I got back from Bakewell and decided I would go into my office and do some paperwork. My son went home at quarter to six. I'm heading off now, Mum. See you later. All right, Philip. See you later. I suddenly realised that it was six o'clock and I hadn't come downstairs and locked my door. There was no sound, there was no creak on the stairs, I didn't hear the back door open, I heard absolutely nothing. It was only the sense that someone is behind you that made me turn around. Thought, my God, he's going to kill me. Please don't hurt me. I know you've got the money. You've been doing the wages. Now give me the money. In the same box, now. In the grey box, I knew it was probably £100. And I thought, if I give him this £100, he will just leave me alone and go. And that, for real? He saw roughly £300 in this cash box. So as he went to get the £300, I got past him. <laughs> I could hear his footsteps coming behind me. <laughs> Suddenly produced these black tie wraps. I thought, oh my God, he's going to tie me up now. He threw the tie wraps onto the floor and then went out through my door. I was convinced he was gone. I got up off the floor, which took me a few seconds because I was in such a state. It's around 6.30pm, two girls waiting at the bus stop on the main road saw a blonde man running from the direction of the house. It's an emergency. Please help me, I've just been robbed! Just now? It's left her feeling vulnerable. She will put a smile on her face and she'll tell everyone that she's OK. But underneath, she isn't OK. I thought I was going to die and I was fighting for my life. This man used extreme and unnecessary violence against a 66-year-old widow, all for the sake of just £500. Somebody out there knows who did this. They need to come forward now. The amount of money he took, for what he's done to me, it's just, I can't, it's just unbelievable. I hate the person who's done this to my mum. And I want somebody to be found. I feel it'll never go away. It can't go away. My life has changed so much because of it. Well, we're joined now by DC Derek Ellis of Derbyshire Police, who we saw there in the film. This has had a devastating effect on Mrs Charles, hasn't it? It has. Aside of uh, her physical injuries, she's um, been left feeling very intimidated. It's important to tell people that in terms of the security at the business and in our home, that's all changed now. Yeah, there's been a complete change in the security. Uh, the, the wages for the drivers are now paid by a banker's draft and any valuable items have been removed from the address. Derek, let's talk about the timing of this attack. It would seem highly significant. Exactly. As you saw in the film, uh, the attacker knew there was £4,500 worth of wages money in the address. Fortunately, he only took £500. He also struck on the one day that Mrs Charles's son had left work early. Right. We believe they may have been watched and were keen to hear about anyone seen hanging around the address. OK, let's talk about definite leads so far. In terms of information, what do you know for sure? OK, there was a white male who was seen running from the direction of the address at 6.30pm. He ran along Netherside and onto Town Lane. Just show me on there, would It's you? the blue arrow featured on the map there. That's Netherside leading up to Town Lane. And also trainers. You've got info about his trainers. Tell me about that. We have. We recovered footwear marks from the scene. These have been identified as an ASIC style of trainer, similar to the one shown. Now, this is, you know, a relatively small community. Do you think somebody watching tonight might well know who's responsible? Whoever did this had key information. So we're asking people to come forward who are connected to the family or the business that may have been asked particular questions about how the business is run. Okay. The attacker may have bragged to friends or may have acted oddly at the time of the offence. Anyone with any information needs to test their conscience and pick up the phone.
Yes, I mean, yeah. we've seen the injuries, haven't we? Uh, yeah. Tell me, that yeah. there is a reward here? There's a reward of up to £5,000 put up by a family for information leading to a conviction. OK, Derek, for now, thanks okay. very much. Someone must know who carried out this really appalling, violent robbery. If that's you, I would urge you to call now. There's the number, 0500 600 600. Now, here's Rab with some criminals caught on camera. And we start with an armed robbery in the Midlands. This is Queen Mary's Road in Coventry on a Tuesday morning last November. The owners of a jewellery wholesalers arrive and open up the store. Almost immediately, they're ambushed by three masked men who'd been hiding in the white van. Once inside, the owners are separated. Out of view, one of them is threatened with a handgun and forced to open the safes. The gang fill up a black holdall with cash and jewellery before making their escape in a waiting silver Audi A3, which drives off at speed with the boot still open. Which proves to be a bit of a problem when in a nearby street they lose their loot out of the back of the car and have to reverse, almost ripping the car door off in the process before they can retrieve it. These armed robbers took more than 150 grand's worth of jewellery and cash, be a gem, and name them tonight. It's the early hours of a Saturday morning in May this year. A group of lads saunter down Church Street in Liverpool city centre when there is a verbal exchange with a man walking the opposite way. Things turn nasty and the victim is punched hard in the face, knocking him clean out. As he lies there unconscious, his attacker sickeningly celebrates. He's a violent thug. Name, please. Another town centre, late at night. This time it's South End on Sea in Essex last August. There's a disagreement between a group of men and two friends. One of them walks off, but the group continue to taunt his friend as well as hurling abuse at him. Suddenly, things escalate and the man in the white top and shorts lashes out at the man in the check shirt, flooring him with a single blow. The victim's friend returns and is also set upon before passers-by step in to help. The man knocked unconscious suffered a broken cheek and fractured vertebrae in the attack. Make the street safer and name this vicious attacker tonight. And that footage is available for another look on the website, bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. And if you know who any of them are, then give us a call 0500 600 600 or you can text us on 63399, type crime space and then your message. Now, some news on some cases that we've featured previously. Well, you'd have seen that the Millie Dowler case has become a major part of the News of the World phone hacking story. But we shouldn't forget that beforehand, we finally had the conviction of Levi Belfield for Millie's murder in 2002. Serial killer Belfield was found guilty after a seven-week trial at the Old Bailey. In a special programme, Kirsty spoke to Millie's sister, Gemma, about the ordeal of the trial. The first two days when my mum and dad were questioned um, by the defence and the prosecution was probably worse than the day that she went missing. It was that extreme. It really was. You just can't explain how horrific it is, it is in that courtroom until you are actually in there. In May, we asked for your help after a student was raped as she walks home in Brighton on Valentine's Day. Well, as a result of a call to the programme, police arrested and have charged a 27-year-old man from Kent with rape. He's due in court in August, and we will, of course, keep you updated on how that progresses. Well, next, a shocking murder we've featured several times over the years. Mum of two, Heather Barnett, was killed in her Bournemouth home in November 2002. She had a lock of another woman's hair in her hand when she was discovered by her two children. Well, two weeks ago, a 39-year-old Italian man, Danilo Restivo, was convicted of her murder. The judge told him that he'll never be released from prison. Italian police now want to extradite Restivo to stand trial for the murder of a woman in southern Italy in 1993. In February, we appealed for the help with this investigation into the murder of student Samuel Gadira, who died after being stabbed through the heart just outside Penge East train station in Sydenham in south-east London. Well, a day after the programme, Crime Stoppers received a call from a person with information about Samuel's death. 
Tonight, detectives are asking for that person to get in touch again. You can speak to Crime Stoppers or directly to the officer leading the case, DCI Lawrence Smith, on this mobile number. 07404 I'll give you that again. It's 07404 So please, if that was you, or if you have any information about Samuel's death, then do please get in touch tonight. Right, still to come, uh, the woman savagely beaten and left for dead in a Rochdale alleyway. Do you recognise this? It's the nightdress that she was found in. And Matthew has the shocking story of how serial killer John Cooper was finally brought to justice. Yes, he's a brutal but calculating man who for years denied responsibility for shooting dead two married couples. But in the end, his lies were no match for the advances in forensic science. It was quite clear that that firearm was causing him significant issues. In the, the debrief after the interview, um, I think it was one of those eureka moments where we all were quite satisfied that that was the murder weapon. And just come over here, take a little look at this. Almost a million pounds worth of stunning jewellery. We need to find out who it belongs to. That's going to come up very soon. But first, Matthew has the latest on what's been happening on the phones. Matthew. Yeah, let's briefly interrupt Steve and his team investigating the murder of Nigas McLean. Steve, what, what's come in so far? Well, I've got to say, in this short time, I've had a fantastic response. Um, there are people who are ringing in, naming names, which is fantastic. And I will be talking to them uh, in, in the next coming in the days because it's really good that they are having the conversation to ring me and, and speak to me. Um, others are uh, providing us with street names, which is, again, is fantastic. What I would ask if, okay. if people can actually give us the full names as well. So street names... And, and do you know if the names are gang members? Yes, and it appears they're other gang members, so it's really important that if they're naming gang members, they give us the full names as well as the street names as well. And there's well. lots of witnesses with the CCTV, a frenzied attack, terrifying attack for Nigas. It was. I mean, you know, witnessed by his brother, he stood no chance, he was outnumbered uh, and stabbed several times. He really didn't stand a chance. All right, so good luck. And Steve is here waiting for your call. Now, Rav's got more of his wanted faces. And first in this section is this lady, 21-year-old Hannah Parveen. She's wanted in connection with neglect and ill-treatment of an elderly care home patient at a hospital in Bradford in 2008. The police believe that Parveen may now be married and using a different surname. Number six is Christopher Ian Edwards, and he's wanted on a recall to prison after breaching the terms of his licence. Edwards, who's 23, was originally convicted of GBH after stabbing a friend in the stomach. He has links to Welling, Bexley, Bexley Heath and Bromley, all in Kent. Now, take a look at this. It's CCTV that we showed you in March of a distraction theft at a jeweller's in Midsummer Norton near Bath, and that's in January this year. As a result of a call to the programme, the woman in red was named as 22-year-old Sava and Kuta, here she is, and the man as 32-year-old Boeri Quebec. There he is at the end. Now, we just need to find them, and that should be quite easy to spot because as Ankuta has several gold teeth and a burned scar on the back of her right hand, while Quebec has tattoos on both forearms, with one reading, Senorita, with a C. Now, they have links to Scotland, Birmingham, London, Dublin and Redditch, and police also still want to trace the other woman with the, uh, in the footage here wearing the white. So... If you know where she and Kuta or Quebec are, then get in touch, 0500 600 600, or you can text 63399, type crime, space, and then your message. And remember, they will all stay online, bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch, until they are caught. It should have been Elaine Doyle's 42nd birthday yesterday. Instead, her family were at her graveside, marking the 25th anniversary of her murder. She was attacked and strangled on the road where she lived in Greenock, in the west of Scotland in June of 1986. Her parents are now in poor health, and so tonight is your chance to help them see some justice. Greenock in West Scotland during the 1980s was a town in turmoil. The maritime industry was in decline and unemployment on the rise. But perhaps the biggest blow to hit the town came in 1986 when a local teenager was brutally murdered just yards from her doorstep. I have to leave this house and I have to pass by the place where my daughter was killed. 
And I know people are looking at me and feeling sorry for me and feeling sorry for my family. Well, I don't want them to feel sorry for me if they know something and they're not going down to the police. There's no good sending me a sympathy card. Elaine Doyle, aged 16 at the time, was attacked and strangled just 50 yards from her front door. 25 years on, her parents, their health now frail, are as determined as ever to bring her killer to justice. The only way to describe Elaine is a happy teenager. Nothing was too much bother for her. She liked mixing with her friends. Elaine was fun-loving, caring. She was very, very funny. She was just a great, great person. She was beautiful. You would never meet another person like Elaine. I think there develops a bond, and it develops as the years goes on. She was a, a daddy's girl. So what do we know about that fateful evening in June 1986? It was the Sunday of a bank holiday weekend, and millions of people across the country would have been staying up late to watch the Mexico World Cup matches on TV. OK, Dad, that's me off to the disco now. All right, darling. Elaine would always tell you what time she's going to come back home at because she didn't want to worry her parents. Oh, e Elaine! It's before she left the house. I says, Elaine, what time will you be home at, love? I'll phone you later, Dad. All right, darling. We all decided to go to the, the Celtic Club because we're all off um, work on the Monday. Had a laugh, a wee dance and a, a giggle. There was no serious dancing, it was all well, to make each other laugh. When she phoned from a Celtic club, I think it was between eight o'clock and half past eight. Hello. Oh, hi, darling. Daddy, I'll be home at 12 o'clock. Well, Maureen and I were quite happy to get that phone call. That was Elaine. She'll mm -hmm. be home at 12. All right. Well, after the disco, we started walking towards Clyde Square. And then it was time for Elaine to go home. And I ran after her and asked her to come back to my house and stay. I promised Dad I'd be back. Okay. But because it was too late, to phone her parents. Um, she obviously said no and headed home. From here, Elaine would have taken a route through Hamilton Way towards her home in the west end of Greenock. And although it was late, many would have still been up enjoying the bank holiday weekend and the football. As soon as I found out Elaine hadn't stayed at Lynn's, when I seen the police activity in their gown street, I knew it was Elaine. And this is how bad is a girl been hurt, and the policeman says uh, the woman's dead. Members of the public will say to you, oh, Elaine was in the wrong place at the time. But Elaine wasn't at the wrong place at the time. She was quite entitled to walk home safely without getting attacked and murdered. Elaine had been strangled and partially stripped of her clothes in what police believed to be a sexually motivated attack. Her murder sent shockwaves through the town and triggered the largest ever manhunt in the Inverclyde area. Witness sightings on the night compounded the police's belief that the suspect was local. On several occasions, a man was seen behaving erratically on and around Ardgowan Street and nearby Nelson Street. 
and there was also a sighting of a young man walking behind a woman who could have been Elaine at around the time of her murder. But none of these men were ever identified. Eventually, with few leads and no suspects, the investigation was scaled down. But in 2003, thanks to advances in forensics, scientists were able to isolate a DNA profile of Elaine's killer. Detectives can now eliminate anyone from the inquiry and put their minds at rest if they are innocent. But in order to do that, they need names. Somebody else knows. You can't keep a secret like that to yourself for 25 years. We would like to put a face to that person, who he is, why he would need to take Elaine's life it doesn't get any easier, but we'll never give up hope. But it's living in a nightmare. We've been living in a nightmare. We're joined by DC Willie Brendan from Strathclyde Police. I understand, Willie, that, that time is of the essence for the family right now. Ex explain a little bit of that. Yes, indeed. Uh, both of Elaine's parents are now in poor health. In fact, Jack gave his crime watch uh, interview immediately prior to rushing off to a hospital in Poynton. So we are particularly keen uh, to bring them the answers that they crave sooner rather than later. Now, it's 25 years since this horrific murder took place. Loyalties changed in that time. And also, as we saw in your film there, crucially, the evidence has changed. You can rule people out for sure. We can indeed. Loyalties do change. People's relationships change. People's perception of what's important in life may have changed. I think it's also important that people understand having this DNA evidence that we now have, we can rule people out very quickly and very easily. So I would urge anyone who has harboured any form of suspicion, no matter how small, that someone they know has some connection with this crime, to pick up the phone and give us the name. OK, that's a big difference from 25 years ago. What about local knowledge then? Do you think this person either lived in Greenock at the time or had really good knowledge of Greenock? We do. We think one or the other. And the reasons for that, um, he displayed some degree of knowledge of Greenock in the commission of the crime. But crucially, we know that Elaine's handbag was taken by her killer on the night of her murder. Yeah. Now, one week after the murder, the handbag turned up on the steps of a local library in broad daylight on fire. We believe this was some bizarre attempt to taunt the police, but crucially, that tells us that the person who murdered Elaine was still in Greenock one week later and again demonstrates some local connection. Yeah, so that's an important clue. You can reveal to us tonight uh, more detail on how Elaine actually died. Yes, I can tell you that Elaine was strangled, that some form of ligature was used to strangle her. We know that Elaine bravely fought back, uh, but quite frankly, she never stood a chance. We have never recovered that ligature. We would be keen to know anything about its whereabouts now, or if anyone knows anything at all obviously about the person. Well, I have to stop you there for now. Thanks very much. 25 years, a very long time. Think back. It was a memorable night because of the bank holiday, the World Cup. For her parents' sake, if you know who killed Elaine, if you have suspicions, call now 0500 600 600. Now it's time for some more CCTV with Raf. Yeah, and this lot of crooks all seem to favour public transport. A train stops at Woodgrange Park Overground Station in East London one night in January and a group of men get on board. They sit next to a male passenger who is travelling alone. As the lone passenger makes a call on his phone, the men in the group switch places so the one in a red hoodie is now set next to him. He puts up his hood and moments later lunges at the man. During the struggle, the victim is punched in the face as the attacker takes his phone. The man manages to push past them into the aisle, but the assault continues. Eventually, he manages to escape into the next carriage, and his attackers get off at the next stop, Walthamstow Queen's Road. Mindless violence, and all for a mobile phone. Tell us who they are tonight. We're still on the railways, but downstairs this time at Barking Underground Station during the early hours of Easter Sunday this year. But these two men lolloping into the station are far from good eggs. The pair meet up with a mate in a turquoise top 
and get onto the waiting train, but stand so the doors can't close. When the driver approaches and asks them to move, he is set upon. He was knocked unconscious and lost a tooth in the attack. The three then flee together from the scene. Do the right thing and name them tonight. This man has just boarded the 119 bus in Croydon, South London, but he doesn't want a ticket. He's aggressive and immediately starts shouting at the driver before attacking him in his cab. Let's make it the end of the line for this thug. Tell us his name tonight. You know what to do? 0500 600 600 or you can text us on 63399. Type crime, space and then your message. Now, a really unusual case of a young woman who was found badly beaten and left wearing someone else's nightdress in an alleyway in Rochdale. With me now is Detective Inspector Melanie Linton from Greater Manchester Police. Thanks for joining us, Melanie. Uh, tell us, what more do you know about this? The victim's Laura, 20-year-old woman, and she'd gone out for the night with friends. Um, they went for a meal, they went temping bowling, and at the end of the night, they went to the Litton Tree Public House in Rochdale Town Centre. In the early hours of the morning, Laura left her friends and started to make her way home. OK, you've got CCTV, actually, yes. of her leaving the pub. Let's take a look at that and describe to me what we're seeing. So we see Laura come out of the pub there, and she's alone. And in a moment, we see her walk towards the entrance of an alleyway, just there. Right. And she goes into the alleyway, which leads off Yorkshire Street. And in a moment, we see a person go into the alleyway just after her. This person here, we really need to speak to that person. They may have some vital information for us. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, what happened next? Two hours later, Laura was found in the same alleyway and she'd been very, very badly beaten. So severely that at, fo at first we thought she might not survive. Really horrific injuries there. Obviously a terrible experience for Laura, who is understandably just desperate to know what it was that happened to her. I think it'll stay with me for the rest of my life to know that someone could actually do that. So for a normal night out with my friends, having a laugh, to end up in hospital. I think they're quite disturbed, really, to do something like that to someone. Um, I just want the person caught and sent to prison. Horrendous. Now, explain more about the oddity of what it was she was wearing when she was found. When she was found, she was wearing just a nightdress. It isn't Laura's nightdress, and we don't know where it's come from. There are no markings in the nightdress, no, nothing to tell us where it may have come from or how it was made. We really need to know more about it. And if anybody knows where that nightdress has come from, I'd urge them to call in tonight. Yeah, or indeed if they can give you any details about where it's bought or anything. Um, what other possessions were missing? All of Laura's possessions, all of her clothes, a handbag, her shoes, everything was missing. And the only item that's been found is a bank card which was handed in at the NatWest in Rochdale some days later. And I'd really like to speak to the person that handed that bank card in. Yeah, that could be really important. OK, Melanie, for now, thanks very much. It's terrible, isn't it? We need to know what happened to Laura. And what about that nightdress? Where did it come from? It is very important that the person seen there on CCTV gets identified, gets in touch. You could do that on 0500 600 600. If you have been a victim of crime, then there is the victim support line. I'll give you their number. There it is, 0845 30 30 900. Now it's time for some more updates on the cases that you've already helped with. Over to Matthew. First, a case we showed last December. Julian Gardner from East Sussex died after confronting a gang of intruders at his farm in October last year. Just two weeks ago, five men, all from Kent, appeared in court charged with his manslaughter. The five men, along with the sixth man charged with conspiring to pervert the course of justice, are due in court later in the year. We'll let you know how that case progresses. And you may remember this face. He's Peter James Hanna, and he appeared on my Wanted Faces board in our last programme after slashing a man with learning difficulties across the face and back with a knife. Well, just minutes after the programme went on air, 40-year-old Hanna was arrested on his way to Liverpool Airport, and last month he was given an indeterminate prison sentence and will serve a minimum of seven years. Nice one. Yeah, nice one. Now, have you ever wondered what a million quid's worth of jewellery looks like? Now you know. Detective Constable Andrea Smith from South Yorkshire Police is here with this extremely valuable, blingy, sparkly lot. How did you come upon it? 
Hi. Well, Kirsty, these are just a, a few of the items that we've recovered from a, a very modest private house during a criminal investigation that right. uh, is currently ongoing. OK, who do you want to hear from then specifically tonight? Uh, we'd like to hear from anybody who recognises any of the pieces, um, any, anybody who's owned any of the pieces. Um, has anybody had any of these stolen from them? Has anybody been given them as gifts? Um, and uh, more importantly, uh, as you can see, some of these items have been custom made. Um, we'd like to know if anybody's been commissioned to make any of the items here yeah, today. I mean, some of them are not just distinctive, really extraordinary in their own way. I've Absolutely. been looking at these earlier. Take me yeah. through this. Um, well, the, the jewel of its value of these items um, has estimated that they will have started off quite plain. Uh, and had the um, diamonds added on this Rolex watch here, uh, and the diamonds and the rubies added to the uh, Chopard watch uh, wow. there. Uh, and, of course, we, we think that this one has actually been custom-made. Yes, let's just talk about this little beauty here, quite a bobby dazzler. It is. Um, the centre stone uh, is a 10-carat diamond solitaire. Uh, it's on a twist, uh, and the twist also has diamonds all the way around it. Uh, and that little item there has actually been valued at £200,000. Just for that? Just for that. Ten carat yes. diamond. You yes. would know if you were missing that, wouldn't you? I think you and would. generally the other stuff, I mean, you know, a lot of diamonds. The, there is a lot of diamonds. In total, the collection is worth over a million pounds. So we are interested to hear from anybody who might know where this jewellery has come from. Goodness me. Those are just some of the pieces that we're looking at here tonight. If you want to have a closer look at them, if you think they might be something that you've had stolen, pictures of everything recovered are on the website, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Um, and if you recognise that incredible 10-carat ring or anything else, call the studio now, 0500 600 600. Now, in May, this man, John Cooper, was convicted of a catalogue of appalling crimes. He is an armed robber, a rapist and a murderer who wrought havoc on a small rural part of South West Wales for over a quarter of a century. But he was eventually caught thanks to some of the most sophisticated forensic work ever seen. Bright summer's day in 1989, Peter and Gwenda Dixon were murdered on a scenic stretch of one of Britain's most popular national parks. They'd been tied up, shot and robbed. The brutal killings would become one of the most intriguing cases for David Powers police, involving terrorist conspiracies, a massive manhunt and decades of forensic work, work which would eventually lead to the conviction of a serial killer. You must judge me after the trial, not before. Get down! Oh, oh. But the Dixons weren't Cooper's only victims. He terrorised the local area for 25 years, committing dozens of offences, including violent burglaries, rape and even another double murder. In the summer of 1989, Peter and Gwenda Dixon had been camping in Littlehaven, a popular spot on the coast in Pembrokeshire in southwest Wales. But when the couple failed to return home to Oxford, their son raised the alarm and a full scale missing persons inquiry was launched. Five days later, their bodies were found by a police search team. They'd been hidden in thick undergrowth. But police were perplexed as to why someone would murder a couple in broad daylight in such a popular tourist spot. One suggestion was that the Dixons had discovered a secret IRA arms dump and had been killed to prevent them reporting it. There was various theories put forward. Um, drug, uh, drug running, a drug importation, that Peter and Gwenda uh, Dixon may have stumbled on, on something of that nature, or potentially the, the IRA. But the most compelling evidence pointed towards it being a bungled robbery. Peter Dixon's cash card was used in the days after the murders and police focused their investigation on finding a scruffy-looking man seen hanging around at banks. But despite two Crime Watch appeals and thousands of police interviews, detectives were no nearer to catching their suspect. Everybody felt that one day we would have a name, the name would come forward, and we would hope then be able to prove that this individual was the murderer. What we were aware of, of course, was that there was very little forensic evidence which we could use at that particular time. 
For years, it looked like the killer had slipped through the net. But in 2006, a group of detectives known as Operation Ottawa were tasked with reopening three previously unlinked serious crimes. Among them was the Dixons murder. One of the other cases was the horrendous murders of Richard and Helen Thomas. After being tied up and shot at their mansion at Scoverson Park near Milford Haven, the house was burnt down in an attempt to destroy any evidence. Do I have right there? Get down now! Get down! They also looked again at an attack on a group of children in 1996 on the Mount Estate in Milford Haven. The assailant had threatened them with a shotgun before raping one of the girls and indecently assaulting another. After two years of tirelessly sifting through thousands of old exhibits, witness statements and images, the team felt that one offender could be responsible for all three crimes. If you look at the ability of the offender to control multiple victims, the rural area, the use of violence, the use of a sawn-off shotgun, robbery, I could be either talking about the Dixon's murder or the attack on the children. For me, that was a significant linking factor when you then run alongside that the fact that the Scoverson Park was only two fields away from the Milford Haven attack. And the name that kept coming up was that of a local labourer. John William Cooper had been uh, arrested and, and convicted in 1998 for a string of dwelling house burglaries which covered the same geographical area as Scotherson Park and the Milford Haven attack. In particular as well, he'd been convicted of an armed robbery. Right, sir! He'd attacked a lone female in the house. He'd tied her up. He'd threatened her with a sawn-off shotgun. He'd beat her around the head with a gun, and he only fled the scene after the victim managed to, to raise the alarm. In a rare moment of panic, he threw his balaclava, gun and gloves into a hedgerow. These items would lead detectives to Cooper. Following his arrest, officers spent four weeks retrieving further evidence from his home and garden. The significance of what they found wouldn't become apparent for another decade. For me, the foresight of the people involved in the Huntsman Inquiry, the people involved in Scoverson Park and the Milford Haven uh, offence, to retain the material in the manner that they did, the storage of it, um, that was one of the significant factors which al allowed us to conduct a, a, a methodical uh, investigation, a transparent investigation, and reach a successful conclusion. Cooper was given a 16-year sentence for the robberies. In the meantime, the new investigation into the double murders was in full flow. And although detectives were convinced he was responsible, they needed scientific evidence to back up their case. They decided to re-examine the items taken from his house during the burglary investigations. Crucial was a pair of shorts taken from his bedroom. It was while we were looking at the surface debris from the shorts on sellotape strip, um, for textile fibres that we actually discovered this tiny, this minute flake of blood. And so, of course, we immediately put it in for DNA profiling using our most sensitive technique because it was a really tiny flake. And we managed to get a DNA profile matching Peter Dixon. During yesterday's interview, John? Yes. And it was Cooper himself who, during his police interviews, would lead the team to their second discovery. It was a, a firearm which was part of the offence of the armed robbery in late 90s. And it was quite clear that that firearm was causing him significant issues. In the, the debrief after the interview, um, I think it was one of those eureka moments where we all were quite satisfied that that was the murder weapon, certainly for the Dixons, probably for the Thomases as well. So we went back to the gun and had a look and we found, um, we found both from the flakes and from the gun itself we found that there was blood staining under the paint, and again, when we put it in for DNA profiling, the profile we got back matched Peter Dixon's. And so we were absolutely sure we were on the right track by this time. Despite overwhelming forensic evidence, Cooper continued to deny any involvement. Have you any explanation to give as to how that blood could have innocently appeared on the shorts? I really do not know. More worryingly is, my son used to take my clothes whenever he wanted it, and that would be more of a worry for a father. Having resorted to blaming his own son, Cooper was now running out of answers. I'm fed up being called a liar. 
I'm trying to help you people. But the facts are, throughout this inquiry, the only person that we haven't been able to eliminate and whose name constantly crops up, be it forensically or otherwise linked to this offence and serious offences, is you. Okay? Because that's all you want to look at. Okay. The time now is 17.01, and no further questions, and we'll turn the tape recorder off. The decision was made to charge Cooper with all four murders and the rape. You must judge me after the trial, not before. Judge me after the trial. Do you want to go in? Yeah, you don't want him to hear that, do you? Over nine weeks at Swansea Crown Court, the jury were told of the damning DNA and fibre evidence that linked Cooper to all three crime scenes. Twelve people from the communities of Wales listened to that evidence over that period of nine weeks and found him unanimously guilty of all charges. 25 years after John Cooper began terrorising this small area of southwest Wales, the families of his victims had finally seen justice delivered. Horrifying man. Four life sentences he got. Yeah, judge me after the trial, we heard him say, didn't we? So we all can. I mean, he's a monster, a psychopath. The judge said the murders were of such evil wickedness that the mandatory life sentences would mean just that. He's not getting out. It was great to see the scientists there. Uh, forensics, the judge said, forensics really the key to this case. Yeah, the fibre evidence was astonishing, just as the DNA work was as well. Remember, they found a speck of blood the size of a grain of sand underneath the repainted shotgun. It was an incredible discovery. And there was great detective work as well. I mean, Cooper insisted that he looked nothing like the artist's impression of the suspect back in 1989. But detectives unearthed video footage of him on the TV show Bullseye a month before the murders. Let's have a look, because what? there it is. I <laughs> okay. mean, there's no denying it, isn't it? It's bingo, it's him. Um, you examined, when you were doing uh, this investigative piece, examined his background. What, what was in his history? What did you learn? It's violence. That is the common denominator over 30, 40 years. I mean, even with his own dog, when it became lame, he didn't take it to a vet, he dug a trench and he spent half an hour clubbing it to death oh. with his shovel. I know. And that's what he was like in his personal life, in his crimes. That's what always jumps out, gratuitous violence. I mean, this guy, there are no redeeming features. He's now where he belongs. Thanks, Matthew. Right, it's time now for a quick check on all of tonight's calls with Rav. Well, we've had loads of calls on the Edmonton murder of Nagus McLean. We've had, in fact, over 40 texts as well coming in. Uh, potential witnesses have, have made themselves known and we're getting lots of names put forward as well. But we need the full names, not just the street names. Also, it's uh, trending on Twitter at the moment. Nagus and Crime Watch both trending on there. We need you to talk to us. And very quickly, lots of people, perhaps not surprisingly, getting in touch about the jewellery that we showed you earlier. The police are going to need evidence that it's yours before it goes anywhere. Join us in the update to follow. Right, that's all for now. That was a busy show, wasn't it? Um, there's even more on the website, including an appeal to find a suspected sex attacker in Brighton. Go to bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Remember, though, the phone lines stay open until midnight tomorrow, so there's still plenty of time to call. If you think you can help, then please do it now. We are back again in 35 minutes after the news with a full update from the detectives from the whole Crime Watch team. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your calls. Bye-bye.